Welcome to Dr. James Cousins' lecture series on Southern Alberta history recorded in 1974. Today, Talk 11 is about the Crow's Nest Pass. The Lethbridge area has a pass through the mountain, and they assumed that the coal, you know, they used to tell us in school that you need more coal, more carloads of coal, than you need of ore in order to smelt. Therefore, it's cheaper to take the, the ore to the coal than the coal to the ore, and they assumed that they would ship the metals down from British Columbia into Alberta, and we'd have great uh, industrial areas. Fernie thought they were going to be that way. Blairmore thought that one was going to be the Pittsburgh of, of, of Canada, and the other one's going to be the El Dorado of the Golden West. Lethbridge, I don't know what it was going to be, but it was certainly going to be a real industrial center, all smoke and smog and stuff. Uh, when I see a picture in the paper tonight of my daughter-in-law ad ad uh, advocating against uh, plants in Raymond, I begin to wonder whether I'm uh, wasting my words on desert air. <laughs> uh, I'm not a great expansionist, though, you know, uh, but uh, everywhere that you look, it's always growth. Progress is always getting bigger, and bigger is always better. And uh, so there, the the Crow's Nest Pass then was of great interest to the people of the area. Now, uh, it's a unique pass in this way, that it's the only pass in the Rocky Mountains that was discovered from the wrong side. Every other pass was a fur trading pass or a gold hunting pass where people had gone over being guided by Indians. Our pass was a, was a result of the expansion of the British Columbia gold rush, so that instead of being a function of the fur trade, we were a function of the gold trade, and it was people coming through the mountain from that side that discovered the Crow's Nest Pass. And Michael Phillips, the fellow who spells his name with two L's and two P's, uh, known as Michel, was a Hudson Bay factor in the tobacco plain south of Fernie. And uh, this is the place where Father Desmet had come from. Well, Mr. Um, Phillips got himself into trouble by expect, anticipating that the gold rush would come that far west and stocking up on a great deal of supplies, which he couldn't sell when the gold rush petered out in that direction and went off in another direction. So he was fired by the Hudson Bay Company. In his journal, he said, when the Hudson Bay Company decided to close its stores in, uh, in the United States in 1870, I decided to go out <laughs> prospecting. Well, he had no choice. He was canned, and that was it. So he decided to stay in the tobacco plane, and he went north looking for gold, the way everybody else was. And he and a fellow named Joe Morrissey uh, went looking. And they were absolutely disgusted, because no matter where they looked, up the Elk Valley, coal. Coal, coal, all over the place. Oh, they wanted coal. His gold was the stuff. And uh, so they felt very disappointed. But Mr. Phillips was very happy, because as he was going up the creek that later was named after him, Michelle Creek, he noticed, a typical woodsman, this always strikes me as interesting, that the deer trail seemed to have widened. And he noticed that the hair on the trails was buffalo hair and not deer hair. And so he said, I knew that I was through the mountains, through the Rockies, without going over any mountain. You know, almost every other pass, like the North Coogee Pass, you got to go up one side and down the other. Crow's Nest Pass, and you're through. It's the shortest in, in, in direct distance. Like uh, in Banff, you know, you, you go this way and up there and across like that. Crow's Nest Pass, you, you hit, say, Vermis is there and, and uh, Bellevue there and Blairmore there and Coleman there and Crow's Nest there and down at the Elk Valley. That's it. You're right through the mountain just like that in a very short distance. So when he came down, this is the interesting thing. The people in the pass talk about the pass always as the pass. And they don't give it a name. I mean, there are other things, Kicking Horse Pass, Yellowhead Pass, but the pass. That's his only one. And uh, this Michael Phillips had the same way of talking. He called it the pass. And then he um, uh, said, and we came out by the lake. Typical Crow's Nest Pass language. The lake. There's only one lake in the whole world. <laughs> the lake. And we always went to the lake. And so he came out by the lake and realized that he had come through without going over any mountain. So that's the reason why in some of the speeches I've given, I call it the pass with no mountain to go over because it's very easy to get through. And uh, yet, Palliser, you remember, said, uh, well, it's a very bad trail and seldom used. That's what the Indians said. 
And the pass itself was not an Indian trail because when the uh, geological survey went through, um, Mr. Uh, Dawson said, it doesn't follow any known Indian trails in this country. So it's unique that way. And it doesn't cost you, you don't have to buy a sticker to go through it either, <laughs> the way you through some, some of these other places. And uh, the interesting thing was that the coal only began to have a value when the people in British Columbia stopped placer mining and started to mine the ore. Then they had one heck of a fantasy of uh, building smelters. So that as far as the area was concerned, coke was every bit as important as coal for the next 50 years. So that realizing that coal was going to be necessary, a Colonel Baker, a former MLA from Cranebrook, which was his original home, it's now called Cranebrook, was interested in these coal deposits and he formed a sort of partnership with the two Fernie brothers who had been gold commissioners watching these damned Yankees coming up through the different valleys. And they started to develop, starting, oh, quite a way, about 10 years before the railway was built, sending men in from Cranbrook, which, you know, Wild Horse Creek was well known, you see, in the 60s and 70s. It was, it was settled country. After all, uh, Putney Brown was a policeman in Wild Horse Creek there. And then uh, years later, uh, the mounted police were stationed up there and so on. Well, um, so he sent his men in and developed the, the mine on along Coal Creek. And these names, Cold Creek and Morrissey Creek and all the rest of the Michelle Creek, are all named after Michael Phillips and his gang. And you wonder, well, how did they ever name them? Because the, the ones on this side of the mountain don't correspond to local names at all. But uh, Dawson in his report says, I received a message describing the coal structures on the other side of the mountains, which I will explore next year. So uh, Mr. Phillips had sent a map showing all the discoveries he'd made and where the coal was and what creeks there were. And so Dawson incorporated Phillips' names. Therefore, you have Daisy Creek and Morrissey Creek and, and uh, Michelle Creek and Elk River and all that. Well, of course, the Elk was fixed. It, it had two different names. One was called the Chute by the French Canadians and the other the, the, uh, uh, the Elk River <coughs> because of the falls at uh, Elko. Well, once they got that railway <coughs> decided that... Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, another man from this side of the mountains, a fellow named William Lee, you remember him? He said that he went up into that area just before the mountains police came. Now, if the police came in 1874, he discovered these springs at Frank in 1873. And by, oh, within 10 years, he had a guest ranch there so that people could cure their rheumatic woes uh, by dipping into the water. You see that? According to the McLeod Gazette, the waters were not as warm as Banff, but they were stronger and effected more rapid cures than Banff. <laughs> but, you know, when the fellows, when the cowboys were out in the kind of weather we can have here and they were riding out, rheumatism, arthritis seemed to be a very common disease. So to get up into the, into the pass and be parboiled was an ideal thing. And so when you read the Lethbridge News, you find that many people would make trips up into the past. For instance, uh, we'll say uh, that Mr. Bentley uh, and his family decide to go up to spend a week or two in the past. Well, you know they were going to go up and stay at William Lee's guest ranch, or they're going to camp there. And one of the descriptions I have, they started out, one group started from Claire's home, for instance, with a, a buggy for the ladies and a chuck wagon and a cook and a man to look after the horses. And the father and the sons, this is John R. Craig, you see, of uh, New Oxley, uh, riding on horseback. And they describe in detail how they would travel along and reach this creek, and they would camp there at night, and they'd get a lot of fish from the old man's river when they went down and so on. So it became a sort of holiday place for this area. And then the, uh, they began to get panicky about uh, the Americans taking all that wealth when they thought it should be coming out this way. Uh, then when the railway was built, immediately the past comes alive and it takes on the pattern that it still has. Uh, this would apply to um, <coughs> um, Tabor, I suppose, and to a lesser extent to Lethbridge. But if you examine the place of origin of all the English-speaking, assuming that Scots speaks English, 
in the mining towns, you'll find that the whole whack of them were miners before they came here. You'll find Welshmen, nearly all from South Wales. If they're North Welshmen, they went to South Wales to work in the coal mines first and then came from there over here. You'll find the Scots are all lowlanders. You rarely find a Highlander unless he's come from Nova Scotia, which is also a coal mining area. So you'll find the South Scots then, the Lowland Scots, you'll find the South Welsh, you'll find the Nova Scotians, and then you'll, in England you'll find the people from the North, from Yorkshire and Lancashire, and a few from Northumberland and Durham, coal mining area. But when it comes to the non-British uh, group, you find no such pattern at all, but the pattern is still a familiar one. It may vary a little from town to town. It was the, the one that... Uh, uh, the, uh, well, the fellow still alive in this town used to call the Bohonks. Uh, this was a, a phase that we went through up there uh, where uh, the uh, only way to be a good Canadian was to forget anything else. So if you were a monoglot bloody Englishman, <laughs> here I go again, uh, then you were a better Canadian citizen, you see. Uh, you getting me on the phone bill show first thing I know. Uh, but, um, so we encouraged these people to forget their languages as quickly as possible. And the result was when this bilingual split-tongued Welshman came along and said, well, look, how would you say this in this language? How would you say that? Oh, I don't know that. You know, how? I've forgotten all this. Well, who are these so-called bohunks that they, they, this fellow called them? Well, uh, we had a group of Slavs. We had Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians usually came from what is now called the Western Ukraine because uh, nobody could get out of Russia. And therefore, the, the group that we have are either Galicians or Bukovinians with a few Hutsule thrown in. So I know those because I, I, I can talk to them and I know who they are. And then there's another group, the Slovaks. These are the so-called Hungarians that everybody gets hung up on. And when I was teaching in Coleman, I got some of the kids. I said, all right, now let's find out where the people of Coleman come from. Now, you, you kids know them. You're a Slovak. You can speak the language. Go down there and find out where they come from. So we got the village, and we got a great big map of Czechoslovakia, and we found that, for a strange reason, that uh, there were three little places, one here, one here, and one about here. That scattered apart. Not one of them was a coal mining town at all. And uh, they were all farm boys who would come out here. And a large number of these people had come in, they got their homesteads, and they came into the mines to work. Well, because work was reasonably steady, I say reasonably, as <laughs> you know the fact, uh, all winter and summer, well, these fellows tended to stay. So when I went teaching in the north amongst the, the Ukrainians, just as many farmers there had worked on the railway or in the mines in the Crow's Nest Pass, as miners in the Crow's Nest Pass had homesteads once <laughs> in the north, which they'd given up. It was sort of a 50-50 split. Some stayed miners, some went back to be farmers. So you had the, uh, those two groups, and then, of course, you had the Polish group. And uh, those were the three Slavic groups. Then we had a large group of Italians, None of those were miners either. And uh, then uh, there were some of the Belgians and people from France, uh, but particularly the Belgians, and they were usually coal miners. They were the only non-British that, that were coal miners in the first place, uh, coming from a, a mining area. So this was the pattern of, of the town we had. You could spot them, and I was up there talking to the old-timers just the other day at the first anniversary of the opening of the home. and. Uh, I didn't know whether to say uh, Comestate or Dobrovacher or uh, what to all those people because they were uh, the same people that I've known who still had difficulty speaking English. Some of them I'd say, I'm an Hawaii joke, you know, because uh, they're, they're old pals of mine. And the interesting thing about the Scots, they're so persistent in their dialect that when I went over to Scotland after about 50 years in Coleman, the Scotch were about the only people outside of the Welsh that didn't have a funny accent. <laughs> I got so used to them that they, 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 I could understand them. But some of the people, like the Slavovians, were my cousins, but I didn't understand them at all. Now, uh, that's the pattern of people, and it's rather interesting. Um, uh, one of these boys said, you know, there were none of these foreigners in uh, the past before... Uh, 1914. They came in after the war. Well, I could say baloney to that, because in 1910, a group of the men in Blairmore, Coleman, and uh, Bellevue uh, formed a Slavic Union. There were Ukrainians and Slovaks and Poles. They all got together. And uh, they put down a list in the Coleman uh, Minor of the names of all the people who belonged to this. One of the names was Grishel, by the way. <laughs> and uh, uh, all, all the names 
that were on that list in 1910 were familiar names right to this day in the past. You could almost pick out the Blairmore, Bellevue, Hillcrest people and so on uh, by the names in that first uh, union. It didn't come to anything. It was just a noble effort that never did get off the ground, you know, uh, uh, but uh, it was going to be a, a miners union. Now, um, how about this past then with this pattern that we have? These people were there right from the very beginning. The schools opened. And uh, because of the nature of the population, the, the population was predominantly Catholic. Uh, except maybe Fernie uh, might have had a majority of Protestants, but uh, none of the other towns did. You'll find it as high as 85% Catholic in some towns and 65%. Now this is ostensibly Catholic, you know. Deathbed Catholics, as the priests call them, you know. The guys, when they're ready to die, then they call them the priests. Well, that's about the only type <coughs> that we had up there. Uh, well... So when the uh, province of Alberta was formed and they wanted to set up a school district, they could set up a separate school district for a religious minority. Well, the towns got to work right away and opened up schools. Well, in Coleman, for instance, the Catholics got together and said, well, we've got to get a school too. So they built themselves a nice little four-room school and then found out that they couldn't build it to, because uh, they were a majority, not a minority, so that they could control the public school if they wanted to. So the past towns never did on the Alberta side, get separate schools. And the result was, I think uh, it's the reason why the people of the past are, are such a peculiar mishmash of people. They're very, very um, uh, drawn together. We, we all consider ourselves members of the past, a distinct race, a superior race. We uh, are, are far better than anybody on the outside of us. Typical mountain people, you see. And the intermarriage that has taken place is so bad that the fact that a fellow has a Polish name means that he may be one-eighth Polish. That's about all it means. Because uh, when I was talking to some of the people up there the other day, the, the jumble is just absolutely awful. Eight-way crosses, you know, <laughs> in the period from about 1900. And these towns all opened in a very short period. Now, Fernie was the first. They started their, their mine in uh, full blast in uh, Coal Creek in, 19, in 1897, just as the railway came in. 1898, they were going, and uh, in 1902, 1899, they had opened Michelle. The town of Natal was formed in 1907 as a sort of a split off from Michelle. There was a, a town called Morrissey in 1902, and there was Osmer and Corbin about 1908. That's all on the British Columbia side, and then on the on on this side, on our side. Blairmore was 1898 in a little shack. It wasn't much of a town then. Frank was the first real town, 1901. And another little town, a ghost town now, called Lille, 1901. Bellevue, 1906. Maple Leaf, 1907. Hillcrest, 1905. Passport, 1907. Coleman, 1903. And the last one, McGillery Mine in Coleman, was the last mine to open in the past. And uh, it was incorporated in 1908, but it opened a separate mine from the International Mine in 1909. So in that period, you could say between 1898 and, and 1908, all the towns in the past were formed. And uh, it's interesting then that today, even to this day, the people from the west side of the past think in terms of this part of the country. Even as far as Kimberley and Cranbrook, they come down to Lethbridge. Uh, and once the road is good, you find uh, a lot of Michelle, Natal, and other places. Uh, you wonder what happened to Sparwood? Well, Sparwood was only a siding <laughs> in the old days. It was called Sparwood because some of the engineers said, wouldn't these streets be nice for maps for ships if we only had ships? <laughs> Close enough here. Well, um, I could um, go on along uh, about these towns, how they got their names, and so on. But the point was that they became mining towns. Uh, British Columbia had company towns. Alberta wouldn't allow company towns, and therefore you didn't get the closed camp on the Alberta side, but you did on the British Columbia side. And you found a, a struggle going on between the miners of the uh, British Columbia side and the company. The company made them buy at the company store. And uh, it almost ended up in a battle until finally uh, the government of British Columbia put pressure on the Crozenet Fast Coal Company and they decided to form 
uh, the Trite Woods chain of stores throughout their, their area, and Trite Wood is still there today, but it was a company separate from the coal company, and their prices were lower. But Carbon, up on the hill a little way by D.C. Carbon, uh, they had a closed camp. And in 1912, they, were, they estimated that it cost 25% more to buy at the company store in Carbon than to buy at the Trite Woods store in Michelle. But if you bought in Michelle, you'd get fired in Carbon. And so, uh, that was, um, and then I want you to notice the uh, interesting thing that happened. Uh, they boomed up to 1908. Then there's a depression. It starts about 1912, and it's rather interesting because uh, there's a new little item in the Furniture Press that says the railway up the um, Elk Valley. The one that's going up past Farwood up to what's the other place? North of Farwood now. Elkford. Elkford. It was going up that way. It stopped, and the kids used to call it the CPR. They used to drive up there and go fishing up the Elk Valley on that old roadbed. Well, it stopped in about 1912, and it says construction has been temporarily abandoned. This is due to a temporary financial stringency. Well, that temporary financial stringency was permanent, and they never did finish that line. Uh, but the, 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 the thing that is of interest was that this past developed and the mine started to go at the same time a settlement took place on the prairie. The result was that the, mine, that the towns were not only mining towns, but they were lumber towns as well. And that if you see pictures of Fernie in the early days, 1904, 1910, you'll find tremendous logging industries, great railways and trains carrying loads of cars, of, of logs down to the sawmills, sawmills all over the place and so on. Uh, shipping out millions of board feet of lumber to build the homes on the prairies as the people settled up here after 1903, 1904, 1905. And uh, the uh, interesting thing was that the miners always had their contracts ending, I think it was April the 30th, wasn't it April 30th contracts ended? And then the man got what one of the fellows called prairie fever. And I think about everybody and his dog in the early days came out then and worked on the prairies helping get the crop in. I know my father worked out here at Chin for a couple of years. And if the strike wasn't settled early, well then they went out and they worked in the fall. But usually they got the strike settled by September, ready to go back in the winter. And the, in most of those strikes that we used to have, there was no bitterness. Fellows used to use the time to uh, build their houses, you know, raise them up. We used to build them on little wooden blocks and they'd fall off after a while raise them up, dig a basement out, put concrete in, and all that sort of stuff. We did that during strikes. And it's, it's rather interesting. That's uh, it's Labor Day, 1922, I guess. My father said, well, do you want to go back to the mine? Strike was settled. Or do you want to go back to school? Well, you know, I can still feel blisters crawl <laughs> from using a shovel. So I thought, no, I guess I'd better go back to school. I get fingers <laughs> cramped, but I, I don't get any crawling blisters in school. And so back I went. But it was the typical of, of the strikes of that period. The only bitterness came just about the time of this depression, 1911, when they, I think the strike started up uh, on the railways in British Columbia, and then they finally spread. And that time was the only time until the depression time when you had violence. There was a, somebody bombed somebody's house in Frank, and somebody attacked somebody else, and they had fights on the street and all the rest of it. But uh, the decline was coming. And the union was defeated, and the, mine, the men went back to work. And uh, the time became so bad about that period that uh, they, well, Coleman did it, Fernie did it, Glenmore did it, Lethbridge did it. You fire all the teachers and hire them back at a lower salary. <laughs> this was some indication of, of, of what was happening. Uh, I'm going to have to check. Uh, I'd have to do an awful lot of checking, if you can imagine how many newspapers I'd have to look through, to find out how many school boards used that device. See, in the Depression, they didn't use that device. What they did was uh, they got permission from the department to pay less than the minimum. And the minimum was $840 a year. And uh, I used to hear school board members boasting, well, you know, uh, we didn't... Uh, uh, we don't pay ours, uh, that we pay $600. Gosh, you pay that much? Hell, we got our teacher for 450 and, and she does the janitor work. <laughs> yeah. 
so when you see the teachers a little truculent with school boards, uh, there are some of us who can remember. And uh, the school boards, when they had their turn to bat, didn't show us any mercy either. <laughs>